Hi, welcome to the iLight database webinar. My name is Vince Paul and I'm the iLight manager and joining me is Joe Petrus and Joe and I together make up the iLight team. In today's webinar, we'll be going over the basics of how to create a database, what a database is and why you might want to use one. We'll also be looking at what happens when iLight imports results into the database from a session file. And then we'll be looking at, in addition to that, how to bring in data that is not part of iLight uh, into your database to make your database more useful. We'll also be looking at some advanced examples, creating uh, a fake dashboard for your lab uh, and another one looking at how to compare a large body of results um, with your session. We won't be covering the iLight uh, Python API or the basics of iLight in this webinar. You can watch the other webinars that we've recorded to get more information on those if you need it. And also there's some example uh, files that you can download from this link uh, if you want to follow along with this webinar, with the examples in this webinar. Most researchers use Excel workbooks to collate their data uh, if your lab is anything like ours, uh, but there are some good reasons to use a database. For one, databases are designed for storing millions of records. So Excel workbooks are designed for storing records up to a certain amount, but they're not designed for large databases. Also, databases have controls on them that stop conflicts where multiple users are accessing at the same time and those users might be making changes. There's automatically built in some mechanism for multiple users to use the database at the same time which you don't necessarily have with Excel. Also, uh, there's speed advantages to using a database. Databases just store the data. They are not trying to provide calculation tools. They're not trying to have formatting or user interface controls. It's just the underlying data. And so quite often the database is separate from the way you view the data. So you might view the data in iLight or in some other third party product. And the separation of how the data is stored and how the data are viewed means that databases can be quite quick at doing what they do best, which is storing and retrieving data. You can also link databases with other, or between tables within the one database and even with other databases. You can do this to some extent in uh, Excel, but you can have quite advanced schemes uh, of sharing data between databases using proper databases. And databases are designed for this. They're designed to be a central repository of records, whereas workbooks, Excel workbooks tend to be a calculation tool. They, you can adapt them and they have become better at becoming at storing results, but this is what databases are for. And conveniently for you, if you're using iLight, iLight will automatically create a database for you and import your results from your sessions into a into the database for you. So it's quite easy. So Joe and I have been thinking about this feature for quite a while now, for, for years in fact. And for those of you who are early adopters of iLight 4, you may have seen that uh, there was a space set aside for exporting results to, to iLight Online. That was going to be an online database, but we decided that uh, not having connectivity with the internet might be a problem for people storing and retrieving results. So we decided to do a local version and that's what this is. And now that we have it, we are interested in these things such as what happens if you were to measure the same sample in different sessions? How far apart do they need to be before you can tell samples apart? And how close do they need to be before you can say they're the same? This sort of inter-session reproducibility. Also, we're interested in things like what effect does it have when you, say, change your lenses or when you put on a different vacuum pump? Do you see a change in your baselines? Do you see a change in your sensitivity? These things are really hard to judge when you're just looking at a single, single session at a time. Also, data, we wanted uh, the database to be able to collate results from multiple studies. So we didn't want to just be able to look at just, just this set of results. We wanted to have a place where you could collect the results from multiple 
studies and f to build up uh, basically project databases and even larger whole lab scale databases. And part of that is integrating ILI with a LIMS, a laboratory information management system and with electronic no lab notebooks. This is something we're doing in our lab at the moment and where it's still an evolving process. Uh, but if this is something you're also looking at in your lab, then we'd love to hear from you and what suggestions you might have as well. Uh, also, we think that having a database of results where you have multiple projects that you can then save out individual um, parts of that database is a much easier way of sharing your results rather than trying to bring together a, a stack of Excel workbooks or a stack of ILIT session files. With the database, you can just save out the parts that you need and send them to collaborators, um, or you can make them publicly available. Some of the commercial and government labs that we work with are looking to get uh, ISO accreditation. And part of that is in how you handle the storage of your data. So this is a step in that direction. Um, again, it's still early days in this, but uh, it can help with m keeping track of how data moves through your lab. And similarly, uh, funding agencies are also uh, in imposing or suggesting, requiring uh, ways of storing your data that's better than just someone has a copy of this data on their computer somewhere. So these were some of the ideas we were thinking of when we were putting this together. You may have different motivations, but we hope that it will also be useful for you too. So Sorry that this uh, diagram is a little bit uh, hectic, uh, a little bit complicated, but the idea is that the, uh, the ILIT database uh, can take in sessions, session files, ILIT4 session files, the .io4 files. It can also take in .pxp files. It can also take in spreadsheets and other files. And they go through this database import module, and that's what creates the database. Then once you have the database, uh, you can do all sorts of things with it. You can link it with e, uh, lab notebooks. You can sort it, filter it, uh, export it, visualize it. Um, and there's also this idea of uh, uh, interaction between your database and other external databases. So repositories uh, for uh, national repositories for, for data. Uh, we're working with the Australian AGN um, database and they're still developing their API, but hopefully at some point in the future, you'll be able to both send, automatically send results when you're happy to, send results to one of these external data repositories and potentially bring them in so that you can use them for calculations or to expand the usefulness of your database. So with that said, I've been talking about databases a lot. What is the database that iLight will create for you? Well, basically, it's an SQLite uh, database, and it's basically just a file. It's a file in a particular format, in this uh, SQLite uh, format. It is a standard database format, so you can open it with other programs, and I'll show that a little bit later on. Uh, you can look it up on the internet, um, and uh, it, it's quite an open uh, format, so there's nothing proprietary about it. Uh, you can put the uh, file that is created, the database file, um, anywhere that you want that you can access it. You can also make it available for other people to access it, either via Dropbox or a server or whatnot. Um, and uh, that's how, and, and as I mentioned before, you can then make it available to multiple users. Um, also, uh, the database have ways of ensuring that um, if you're making changes to the database at the same time as somebody else is, that those, uh, those changes don't conflict with one another. Um, you can create multiple databases because uh, it is, as I said, just a file. So if you make a mistake during, um, during today, especially, you can just delete the file, it doesn't matter. And especially when you're testing it out with your own data, you can uh, delete anything that you, you don't want. So it is just a file, basically. 
And you can use iLights interface, the interface that we've built uh, for sorting and filtering and for running uh, certain commands. But you can also uh, use uh, other third party programs and you can use this SQL uh, language, which um, uh, is a very common language and you can find heaps of resources for it on the internet. So let's just have a quick look at the database interface um, and then we can actually start uh, running an example. So this is what it looks like when you click on the database view in the left hand column here, this little database uh, icon. And it has uh, over on this left hand side, we have the sessions uh, side of the, of the interface and then we have the results side over here. And at the top of the sessions part, there are these two buttons, uh, new, data, new DB, which stands for create new database and open DB for opening a database. And right next to that, we have uh, buttons for importing and removing sessions. So let's uh, give it a shot. We have two example sessions. This, there's the DRO example session um, that people who have done uranium lead will be familiar with. Uh, there's also this other one, this Zerk 90 series example. They're both uranium lead uh, example data sets. Um, sorry, we don't have more, but uh, we don't measure a lot that we can then just share with everyone. So we just have a couple of uh, examples here, but hopefully they'll illustrate the concepts that we want to get across. So let's start by clicking on uh, in iLight and starting a new session. And then when we're in the database view, we'll import those two sessions. So let's do that. So I'm going to start a new session. If you can't see my screen, just let me know through the chat. Okay, so I've started a new session and I click on the database view. And up the top here, I'm going to create a new database. So I'm going to click on this new database button. And then I'm going to put this in this folder here. I'm just going to call it WebDB and click save. And now we have a new database and you can see the name of it up there. And it's saying, please import sessions because we haven't imported any sessions yet. So there's nothing in the database. So I'm gonna click on this button up here, this, uh, this little down arrow um, for importing session. If you hover over the button, you can see that it gives an explanation of what the button does. And also just as a little tip, uh, any of the buttons that have a little down arrow beside them, uh, that means that if you click and hold on them, they will open up a, a little menu. If you just click on them once, just uh, click and release, it, it'll it um, act, act like a normal button. So you can see there's another one over here and some other buttons that have these little down arrows. Each one of those, if you click and hold on it, you'll see more options. But uh, now I'm going to import those two sessions. So I'm going to click on this add session file to this database button. And I'm going to select, uh, I've got an extra one here, uh, but I'm going to uh, click on the draw example and the Zerk 90 series underscore example.io4 file. Oops. So I'm going to select both of them. You can select as many as you like in this window. Uh, that's actually 30, uh, almost 38 megabytes there, but uh, what the, the import module does is it just takes out the results. So now you can see we actually have some results in our table and you can see we've got a couple of sessions listed up here. So I'll just explain a little bit better what, what just happened just then. We can click on the button without zoom, oh, <laughs> zoom keeps pinching it. Okay, that's just getting frustrating. Okay. So uh, what happened when we create a database? So basically the database import module extracts all the data, the results data from the session files. So for each selection in the session, there's a row that's added to the database. And if you have your database open, you'll be able to see this. Uh, and for every channel, there's also a column. Uh, there's also a bunch of columns that, um, that are there for metadata about each selection. So it's start time, it's name, so on and so forth. Uh, if you open a, a, an experiment that has columns that don't already, already exist in the, 
in the database. So for example, if we opened a uranium lead experiment and then we opened a trace element experiment, there's going to be a whole bunch of concentration channels that are not already in the database and the import module will add those to your database for you. And there's also a bunch of properties of selections. These are also added as columns. These things can be metadata, such as the start time and the end time, but you can also make your own columns uh, and your own properties for your selections. Um, and we'll come back to that later, but this is a way of bringing in uh, uh, data that is external to the experiment, data that I like doesn't know about uh, from the session file, and you can bring it in and create new columns from it. But we'll come back to that a little bit later. But just this idea that properties of selections become columns in the database. Uh, the database doesn't bring in any time resolved data, it's only bringing in the means and the uncertainties. And all selection types, including baselines, are brought in. So that means that you can actually check your baselines and see if they're changing with time and see if they look normal compared to other experiments. And all channels are imported, including your input channels, your intermediate channels, and your output channels. Now, because it is just bringing in the mean and the uncertainty for each selection, it means that it's not really useful for imaging experiments. But it, you could still use it to keep track of how your secondary standards are doing in your imaging experiments to see if you're still getting roughly what you'd expect. Um, the database contains three tables. The main one that we'll be using is the results one. That's the one that you could see when we imported uh, our, our sessions. And that contains the selections with their metadata and, their, and each channel and its uncertainties. Uh, there are also two other tables that you don't see by default, and that's a channels table, which contains a description of all the channels that are in the sessions that have been loaded. And there's another one that contains information about each of the sessions that have been loaded. Uh, and we'll have a look at those in just a sec. Most of the time you do most of your work in the results table, but they are there if you want to be able to pull the data out um, from those other tables. Um, and metadata is automatically copied over, but it really depends on what version of ILAT you're using. So uh, when the selections were created. So even if you're using ILAT 4, if you're using an earlier version of ILAT 4, it may not have copied across necessarily things like the scan speed or the spot size or those sorts of things. Um, you can add those later manually, uh, but any experiments that you start from later versions of ILAT will incorporate that information uh, automatically. Um, Rita has a quick question saying, from the red text warning at the bottom of the screen, to my mind, the obvious thing to do would be to end each uh, image session by making representative spot selections in each area of the image. Okay, and you would have that to compare across the full database. <laughs> the question is, would that be reasonable? Um, I, that could be reasonable. I guess it really depends on your samples and whether or not they have a representative region uh, and what that information would uh, represent in your database. But it's certainly something you could do. Um, there's nothing stopping you from doing that at all. Uh, okay. So here's some conceptual ideas that, that myself and Joe have had when we were putting this together, but they're just ideas and not rules. So the idea that we had about the database is that it's sort of like um, the final version of your results. It's not necessarily meant for um, bringing results in to compare and then taking them out again and changing them and bringing them back in again. Um, in that regard, you can only have one copy of each session in the database because each session is given a, a unique identifier. And if you try to import it again, it'll say, hey, we've already got a copy of that. Um, so you can't import it. The idea is there that it then doesn't mess with your statistics by bringing in uh, duplicates. Uh, and also I think conceptually to compare the differences between uh, say when you've, you've processed your data one way 
and then you want to compare it by changing just something small, um, that's something that's probably best done in Excel where you're just looking at two versions of the same experiment. The database is more sort of a long-term uh, uh, long term record of results. At least that's how we've conceived it, um, but that's definitely not um, set in concrete either. The other thing that might be a little bit confusing is that even though you might be working on a, on a particular session, that session isn't related to the database view at all uh, until you import it into the database. Uh, that also means that if you change session, um, sometimes there might be stuff that you're doing in the database, you might have set up a particular view, um, that will also go when you change session as well. So just, just something to be aware of when you change sessions and the idea that the current session is not special and is not in the database until you add it. Okay, so looking at the database interface uh, in a little bit more detail, we have up here in the top right the currently the name of the currently open database, and we have a list of sessions. In this one, we have just a pitiful two sessions, but hopefully, when you start importing your own sessions, you'll have plenty of data there. It has the name of the, the session and it also has how many selections were in that session as well, just as a quick heads up and the date the selection, uh, so the session started. We also have this results table. This is where your results are. Uh, so each row in here is a selection and each column is, as I mentioned, a property or a channel result or an uncertainty. At the top here, we have this query type selector. There's either simple queries or SQL queries. And here we have, in this case, where we're looking at the simple query, we have the query controls. And this is basically a table of criteria and some buttons up here as well. Down the bottom here, we have the plotting and scripting buttons. And we'll show some examples of using those later. And we also have the export button for saving out what you can currently see in your results table. You can click uh, right click on the sessions that are in the session list, list on the left hand side and you can select to show only results from that session or you can right click on it to open that session. However, when you do that, it will open a new session and as I mentioned that any unsaved filters that you have open for the database may not be saved. You have to make sure you save them before you change session. So the results table, um, so I'll just switch back to um, so I like, so here's the results table. I'm just going to make that a bit bigger. So if you scroll across, you can see that there is a column for every channel and uh, including, uh, the baseline selections. Um, and there's also a column for each uncertainty, although we can't see uncertainties just yet. Um, and if you've recorded your dwell times or if your dwell times are included in your in your data import format then they'll be in here as well if they're not we recommend that you specify them if you want to uh, be able to compare results between different uh, between different sessions then you need to know what dwell times you used and what spot size you used and those sorts of things so you can also in this view, you can click on the top of the heading to sort by that, uh, that column. Uh, if you click on it once, it's ascending, click on it twice, it's descending. You can also click and drag the comments around to reorder them. So you can columns around so that you can reorder them. And in the top right corner up here, there's this filter columns button. So here, if you click on that, you can see that they're ordered by input, intermediate, output, associated, associated are things like error correlations that you can see here. Uh, they're not necessarily uh, directly the results of a channel, but they're calculated from results from channel results. Uh, and you also have your metadata, things like the group type, the start time, the scan speed, those sorts of things. Um, for uh, experiments, uh, so for, for intermediate and output, uh, channels. It also sorts them by the DRS that was used to calculate them. So if we had a bunch of different DRSs, say we had uranium lead and hafnium isotopes and trace elements, these menus would be ordered uh, according to what DRS they, they came from, which is really handy if you're trying to work out what, what uh, DRS the channel came from. 
Um, so that's the uh, filter. Oh, you can also right click on this table and click uh, append column. So you can add your own columns. We'll come back to adding columns later on for properties. Um, you can also right click on a value and say copy it and it will copy the value in the cell that you clicked on to your uh, clipboard. Um, so let's now start with some basic filtering examples. So we have this filter, uh, this query table up top here, and this table basically contains a, a list of criteria. And you can add criteria by clicking on the plus button and remove them using the minus button there. And let's just do a, a quick example where if we wanted to just show our reference materials, we could click here on the plus button. And we're going to say we only want to see when our group type uh, is reference material. So I'm going to double click on this column uh, entry here. So we can select what column we want to filter by. And we're going to select group type. And we're going to say the group type needs to contain ref or reference. And we press enter. You can now see that we've just picked out from our uh, from our two sessions our reference materials. So in this case, we had three reference materials: nine one five hundred, Plesovice, and Tomorrow Two. We can add more criteria to that. So we could say it has to be a reference material, and uh, the group name has to have uh, Tomorrow in it or Tem in it. And now we've selected out all our Tomorrows from the two different um, sessions in this case. You can also use more advanced things that you can say within a range, uh, not within a range, equal to all the things that you can do in the normal uh, 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 automatic selections uh, interface, uh, you can do that here. So if you wanted to select results that are above a certain um, value, you can do that here as well. And you can get rid of criteria, like I said, by clicking the minus. You can also clear the criteria, all criteria here, and it'll ask if you are sure. And down here, this button, if you click on it, it will show you your history of what you've typed in recently, but you can also save your current, uh, your current criteria, as well as any filtering that you've done on your columns. So when you click save here uh, and give it a name, it will record your criteria and your filtering there. So just something to be aware of if you to click one of these and you can't see all of your columns, then it might be that you still have some filters applied up here. The good thing about that is that you can set it up so that you have uh, just the columns you want and just the sample types that you want, say, to be able to just uh, export straight to isoplot or some other um, some other uh, set format like that. Okay. Um, and yeah, so I mentioned the history. I think that's, that's the basics of that. Um, okay. So now that we've got the very basics of filtering um, under control, let's uh, look at plotting. So in, we now have, I now have uh, just my reference materials um, visible in my um, in my table, my results table, and I want to create a plot showing what the calculated 206238 age is for that. So I'm going to click on the create plot button down here. Now this time I'm just going to click on it just once and it'll bring up this plot. And to add to this plot, we can click the add graph button at the top left here. And then it gives us this dialog to allow us to select uh, what we want to plot on plot on the y-axis and what we want to plot on the x-axis. So in this case, I'm going to plot the uh, calculated final 206238 age, and I'm going to plot that against count. I could plot that against uh, something like the start time here, but because I only have two sessions and they're very spread apart, it's going to look like basically a line between two points. So what I'll do instead is just do them by count. And this is just basically plotting them against one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Uh, so if I click okay, 
you can see that it's plotting these for us. I have obviously some massive outlier there um, in my results. I'm not sure what that one was from. Oh, that was a dud tomorrow, I think, that I didn't delete. Um, and we can actually style this graph. Uh, and there's a lot of options here. We're just going to barely scratch the surface, but we will do a quick example, but there's a lot here that you can um, play around with yourself and, and create really good quality plots with. So to do that, we're going to click on the settings button up here in the middle top right. And you, from this screen here, we can uh, add tools. So we can add the normal tools that we see in the time, uh, time, time series view. We can add a title. Uh, so we check that and say my plot. Uh, we can change the font and color of those. We can also set the exact ranges of these. So let's set that to say 1200 instead. Um, so it's between say 300 and 1200. And we can also change how it's plotted. So at the moment it's plotting a line between each point. But if we wanted to plot that as say markers, uh, in here we've got a bunch of things that we can uh, adjust like the axes, the ledge and the overlays. Uh, in this case, we're going to open up this main uh, thing here so we can see the plottables, the, the plotted uh, data. And we just have one graph at the moment called graph one. We could give that a name if we wanted. Uh, and we're gonna change it from being a line to a marker. So we're gonna check this marker and we're gonna say disc and we're gonna give it uh, some other color just for fun. We're also gonna get rid of this grid, um, just make that non-visible there. And then when we close that, we now have our plot. So we can see the 91500s along here and we can see our Pleasant Chase and Tomorrow's here as well. Um, this is only two sessions, but uh, so it doesn't really tell us much, but it's actually this variation in the secondary reference materials that gives you a good feel for if we had a lot more sessions, uh, how reproducible your secondary reference materials are. And they are a good indication perhaps of how reproducible your results would be if you measured the same sample uh, over and over in every session. Uh, you can also remove the, uh, the tools once you're happy with the, the extents um, so that they're not there when you want to create your plot, uh, so when you want to save your plot, and then you can click export and it will save it as a PDF wherever you choose it. Uh, as I said, there's a lot of set, uh, settings that we didn't um, cover there, but once you get this set up exactly as you like, you can save it as a template and once you save it as a template, I'll just call this uh, my age plot. Say. Then when I close that, now when I click and hold on this create plot button, it'll show me the templates that I've created. And I can click on that and it comes up again straight away. And the great thing about that is that even as I add more sessions to my database and expand my database, they'll be included in this plot. So if I added another 20 sessions, they would automatically appear in this plot. Uh, and you can create as many plots, different plots as you like, and they'll all just come up as templates here. So that's, uh, that's basic plotting uh, in a nutshell. I didn't show how to add uh, error bars. I'll just quickly do that as well. So in the settings, um, in the items, I'll click on this and I'll just click on error bars down here and it was the output and it was the 638 age 2SE. It's just the internal one. Um, and you can see that it's added those there just so that you can see how that's done for completeness. Okay, so that's plotting in a nutshell. Um, now let's look at how to export um, I'll just check, make sure on the questions. Okay, yeah. Um, uh, let's have a look at exporting. So it's really quite simple. It's whatever you can see in this table. If you click on the export button down here, you can export it either as a CSV file or an Excel file. If you want all of your data to be included, just make sure you haven't set any filters or any uh, criteria here. Uh, and as I said, that will save it out as a uh, thing. So you can, you can subset your data save it as an Excel file and send it to somebody if you want.
Now let's have a look at some basic SQL uh, queries. So uh, SQL stands for standard querying language. Is that right? Anyone know? Um, structured, I think. Structured, that sounds better. Yes, I knew Joe would know. Um, oh yes, Joe, Joe's just mentioned in the chat that uh, uh, in the results table, these results are basically fixed. Um, you can't edit them at all. Um, but if you have edited your session file, um, when you start the, when you open the database, it will look at the, the, the time that it's recorded for when it imported the um, file. And it will also look um, to see if that file has been modified. And if the two dates don't match up, then it will say, hey, you've modified this file since it was imported to the database. Do you want to fix that up? And basically, you would, you would unload this session by clicking here and then re-import it again. And it would have the updated values. So let's look at uh, SQL, Structured Query Language uh, Queries. Um, and to get to that part of the interface, we click on the SQL Query button in the top right here. When you do that, you might notice uh, that you can see two new columns here. They're the session ID. This is the unique identifier for each uh, session. We only have two sessions, so there's only two values in here, two unique values and the selection ID. This is that unique ID that I was talking about uh, for each selection. Each selection has a unique ID um, so that you can't accidentally import it to, uh, twice. And you can type in SQL statements up here. For those who are SQL ninjas, uh, you can only type in one SQL statement at a time here. Uh, if you try and type in two, it will actually tell you there's a, there's a, there's a problem. So let's look at a very basic uh, one. Uh, just to explain what's happening here, um, this is the oops, this is the query here, and it starts off with select star from results where group name is in so in this list of values here, order by group name. So what does that mean? Well, let's actually we can actually type it in bit by bit and see what it does. But this uh, select star from results means. Uh, select and then it's asking for column names and the star is an SQL shortcut for all the columns and it's asking from what table do we want to bring them in from in this case we're using the results table so let's type that in you say select you don't have to worry about case select star from results and if we run that actually nothing will change because that's what we're already viewing here uh, if I'd done something wrong and said select star from result and there's no table called result, it would actually tell us, sorry, no such table. We can just fix it, click run, and we're back to being good again. So that's how you select uh, the columns from a particular table. Now we want to actually add some filtering. So we're going to say where, and here is where we type in our column name. So we're going to say we want a group name which is this column here. We're going to filter by this column here. Um, for the column names, you have to put these little back ticks um, before and after the column name. That tells it that it's a column, basically. And the back tick, if you're looking for it, that's uh, just uh, underneath the tilde symbol in the top left of English keyboards um, next to the one. And we're going to say where group name, and we could just say uh, equals and then we're going to put in a value in comments. So if we said group name equals uh, baseline and ran that, then we've just selected our baseline. If we want to select multiple values, what we need to do is say in and then surround the values by brackets. And we're going to say um, z underscore positive and comma z underscore Tomorrow, two, and if we try running that, and now it's just selected our Pozovice and our uh, Tomorrow two, and then this other line that we've got here in this presentation here, this order by uh, that's optional as well, uh, but that will 
tell us how we want that that will tell it how we want our results ordered so how we want them sorted so we can say order by and we just put in um uh, selection sorry uh, column names here so we could say by group type and if we want to sort by more than one column we can just separate them by columns say group and then we hit run and you can see that it's selected just those um, and it's ordered them as we said if we wanted to say just uh, if we wanted to put in just some columns so we could put the columns in here. So we could say select uh, name and you can see it just spits out there. And if we wanted to just the name column, if we put in say name and say final uh, led 206 slash 238 typos excluded. Let's see how that goes and it's just exported those. So this is really powerful um, for giving you full control over what you can see, but you can do a lot of that in the simple query by filtering and by typing in your criteria up here. The difference is up here, you can't really do and comparisons. It's sort of, sorry, you can't do all comparisons. It's only and comparisons, if that makes sense. Um, this is an example where we've done a select query where we've selected results, but you can also use this SQL interface to um, add results, uh, to update results and to delete results as well. Basically anything you can do in SQL, you can do it here. Um, oh, one thing to note is that when you're in this SQL view, if you click uh, in the SQL view, if you click here, uh, on the column headers, it doesn't actually do anything. And that's because the ordering is controlled by your SQL query statement, uh, not by what column you click on. So just to uh, avoid conflicts between what's written up here and what you click on down here, this one always takes precedence. Okay, now let's have a look at uh, some of the really powerful stuff. So all of the database data is available for um, uh, for use with the Python API. So that means that you can do amazing things with it. And unfortunately, we don't have amazing examples. We've got some good examples, but not amazing examples. But uh, we've got a few example scripts that we've got there um, that we hope that people will use to sort of uh, expand upon um, and do cool things with. So as just a quick basic example of one Python script, um, we can create a kernel density estimate diagram. And we're gonna do that uh, for the samples that are in our, in our database. So to look at what samples we have of the ages this is. So we're going to just show the samples by, uh, sorry, the group type equals sample. So you can see we have uh, some 903s and some 905s and some DROs in there. And just so you can see what we'd expect if we plotted up um, some, uh, the age plot for that. So let's do that for our age plot. Uh, you can see, and I'm gonna rescale this. You can see that we have a population here in the sort of 300s, 380s up to uh, maybe say 400, uh, then we have some between say 600 and 900, and then we have some older ones at around 2,000 2, million years. So that's the underlying age data, and we can create a KDE of that just by clicking and holding this run script button. And we're gonna select, so there's some other examples here, and you can, uh, you can view these, these are all open and, and editable, but we're gonna click on this KDE one. And when we click on that, it'll ask us what column we want to create a KDE from. And we're going to go to the final 638 age, click OK. And you can see that it's created a KDE for us. Uh, this is just like one of those other plots. So you can adjust the settings for it like before. Uh, you can rescale it um, by right clicking on it or by bringing up the tools and adding, um, adding access labels, etc. So that's just a very quick example of what you can do. And as I said, you can uh, subset your database any way you like and create new KDEs as well. 
Um, so hopefully that was a quick example. And now we'll talk about uh, how you can bring in uh, external data. So this is the sort of thing that's not included in the session file. So for example, if you had uh, an international geological sample number uh, for your samples, uh, ILAT doesn't necessarily know about that from the mass spec data or from the log file. At this point, it only knows what you've included in the log file and the mass spec data and anything that you might have typed in um, manually. But so, so they don't appear in the database uh, yet, but you can add those. And there's a couple of different ways. Well, there's a, there's a few different ways. You can either add them to individual selections manually. You can manually add properties to groups of selections, whole groups of selections. You can also do a batch import using uh, Python scripts. And we'll do an example of each of these. Uh, you can also do it within the database using SQL. Um, so let's have a look at an example of that. If I was to open, so as I mentioned before, the database is independent of the session. So we have two sessions open here, but we don't actually have a session open at all at the moment. If I had set up some sort of very uh, complex uh, query here that I wanted to keep, I should say save here. Um, before I start a new session, because otherwise that, that won't be kept. So we're going to say, not new session, we're going to open a session and we're going to open the Zerk 90 uh, uh, series example.io4 file. So this second one here. Uh, and you'll see that when it does that, it, it starts a new session, loads that the, the session and you see the database is not open anymore, um, but we do have our session. You can see all our files here. And when we look at the selection browser, and when in particular, if we look at our unknowns, we have the 903 group and the 905 group. And you can see we've got a bunch of selections here. And if I click on any of those selections, you can see the, the properties and the values for those uh, selections. So the spots uh, shape and the spot uh, diameter in this case are properties of the selections, just like the name is and the start time and the end time. And these are all the default ones that are added when you create your session, but you can also manually add some as well. So if I wanted to create uh, a property, I could click on this plus button down here and it'll add this my new property. So I'm going to call this, uh, what's the property that we could add? We could call it uh, the project. What project is this part of? And we'll call this uh, project one. So to change these values, you just double click on them. And, um, and now we've added a property to our selection. And if we were to save this session and import it into the database, there would now be a new column in the database called project. And at this point, none of the other selections have a value for that. So it'd only be, where did it go? It'd only be this selection that has a value for it and that value would be project one. So it's not super handy. Uh, it's not a very quick way of adding properties that are common to all your selections. A way to, if you want to remove a property, you can just click on this minus button as well. And it'll say, are you sure you want to get rid of it? I'm sure. Now, if I wanted to add a property to all of these selections at once, I could just click on the selection name here. And I'm going to click the plus button here and do the same thing. So we call this a project here, if I can spell correctly, project. And I'm going to say, this is from the nine, 903 project, oops, 903 project. And now when I click on any of these selections, they all have that project property and a value for it, the same value for it. So that's a very quick way of adding, uh, adding properties to all selections within a group. And I could do the same thing here, add the same property called project, oops, make sure it's spelled exactly the same. 
so that we only have one column. If I had project uh, and projects, they would come up as two different columns. And we'll call this the 905 project. And you can now see that this, uh, all the selections in this group have that. So if I was to go back to my database and reopen it, um, I'm gonna just open, click open. And it was this database here. And I'm gonna uh, remove these values because I can't import this session again until I've removed the values. So I'm gonna remove them and then bring them back in again. Did I save the project? I saw the session. I'm not sure if I saved it. You gotta save it to make sure the uh, the uh, values are in there. No, I didn't save it. Uh, so up here, I should have said save session first so that those are now stored in the session file because that's what the database uh, import module reads. So I'll just re-import that again. Lucky it's pretty quick. And now uh, when I scroll across, you can see that there is now this project column here. So I could now filter uh, by project name if I'd added uh, the project for all of them and I've filtered it so they're at the bottom. So that's a way that you can add project uh, labels, or you can add uh, it, what publication it came from, um, uh, any extra metadata that you want there as well. Um, but if I wanted to add a value that was unique for every, uh, for every selection, so say for example, an IGSN, uh, a sample number for each one of these, uh, that would take quite a bit to type in manually. So what you can do instead is you can export all your selection labels and we'll just do the 903 um, selection group here. And I'm gonna export all these to a spreadsheet and then I'm gonna fill in the spreadsheet and bring them back in. And we're gonna use that using a couple of scripts. So the first script uh, is in, if we go to the Python workspace and we click open and there's this export in the scripts folder that you may have downloaded. There's this export scripts, uh, sorry, export cell names.py file. And if you click open on that, it uh, shows you what it does. Basically it just gets the selection labels and puts them into a, uh, an Excel spreadsheet for us. So we'll just uh, quickly run that. It'll ask you which group you wanna do. We'll do the 903 group. And then it'll ask you where you wanna save it. And we'll just pop that in that folder as well. And we'll just call it cell labels. I'm just gonna replace the file I have there already. And then if we open that file, in here, the cell labels file in Excel, you can see what it's done is, just ignore this for a sec. It has taken uh, our selection labels and put them into a column for us called with selection label at the top. And now we could start adding properties to this um, table. So for example, we could say what project they're from and uh, what publication they were published in and so on and so forth. And we could actually just copy and paste there. And that's a lot easier than doing it typing in one by one. Just to save us some time, uh, I've already filled that out in this file called cell labels filled, which is also in this folder for you. And it just has, as I said, the selection labels and I've made up some IGSNs for each uh, sample. Also what field trip they were collected on. Um, there's a bit of a joke here that I went anywhere in 2020. I don't think anyone went anywhere in 2020. Uh, also, there's another in joke that, uh, that I may have collected samples and published them in the same year as well. So we're actually gonna import those values. And to do that, we're going to click uh, open. So the same thing in the Python workspace, we're gonna click open and we're gonna open that other script that's called import selection properties or cell properties.py and we click open. And when we run that, what it'll do is it'll ask us for, 
it'll ask us for our spreadsheet with our properties. We're going to click the cell underscore labels underscore field um, spreadsheet. And it'll ask us what group we want to apply those to. It's the 903 group. And what it does is it goes through and it looks at the selection label column and anywhere there's a match, it copies across those properties. So now when we go back to our selections, you can see that if we click on one of these, we now have an IGSN for our sample. We have uh, what field trip it was collected in and what publication it was published in as well. So it's just using those two scripts, one out, one back in again, we're able to add a lot of detail to our, uh, to our session file. Now, if we save that, And if we add it back into our database, so we go to database, I'm going to re-import that. And it's this one here. And now if we scroll right across, we now have the IGSN values here. We have our project and we have our publication. So we could, we could filter by these, we could um, subset and then export by those, we could plot using those as well. So that's a way to bring in external information. It could be other things like uh, uh, ratios that you've measured using a different technique um, that are not in iLight files, um, those sorts of things as well. So uh, we've just looked at how you can add properties to your database uh, that bring in external information. You can do it manually for individual selections. You can do it uh, for groups selections and you can do it by batch import. Now we're going to have a look at, um, uh, so we've, we've covered all that. Now we're going to have a look at a slightly more advanced uh, example where we're going to create a, a fake report for our lab. And the idea being that you could create a dashboard like this. And as you keep adding selection, so adding uh, sessions to your database, you can just run the report again, the, the script again, and it'll update your report. So you can keep track of what you've been, uh, what you've been doing in your lab, at least with your laser anyway. So what we'll do is we'll create some columns to hold uh, these new, these two new columns called work type and analysis type. And we're going to put some dummy values in those. And then we'll use this Python package called report lab to create a, a very simple uh, dashboard. So to do that, we're going to add tables by, uh, oops, by uh, copying in these commands into the SQL side of things. So this alter table, and we're going to add this work type uh, column. So we do that here in the SQL and we can just paste that. And when we run that, nothing happens uh, because we haven't selected anything. We've actually just altered the database. We haven't actually selected anything. So nothing appears in the results uh, uh, table. And then we're gonna do the same thing with, oops, with the other line here where we add the analysis type column. And we'll paste that in as well. We'll run that. And now when we scroll across, you'll see we've got two extra columns, this work type and analysis type. Now to create dummy values for our fake, uh, for our fake report, we're going to just set anywhere that the sample name has draw in it. We're gonna say that there was an academic uh, work type and that it was geochronology. Anywhere where it says 903 in the name, it's government and trace elements. And anywhere it says 905 in the name, we're going to give it industry and happening isotopes. As I said, this is all just made up uh, because it's all geochronology data. But uh, so we can copy these into the SQL uh, thing. And one thing to note when you're copying stuff like this is that uh, sometimes uh, Excel and uh, in PowerPoint in this case likes to change straight quotation marks into curly quotation marks. So if you come across some errors, that might be it. Uh, so it's just uh, assign some values there. Now we're going to do the same thing here. Um, just make sure we delete that top line. 
and we're going to run that. And we'll run this last one. Okay, and now when we go and have a look at those columns, we should now have values in them. So we've we've assigned some government type, some trace elements, etc. as I mentioned. So now we can actually run this Python script that if you click on run script down here, and if you go to the scripts folder of the example data and click on the yearly.py and click open, Uh, what it does is it creates the report for us and it's going to ask, uh, ask us where we want to save the, the resulting PDF. So I'm going to call this report.pdf. You have to type in the .pdf because it doesn't know what type of file it is. Uh, and we click save. And now if we go to that folder, there is this report.pdf. And if you open that, you can see that it's created a just a simple database summary for us. So, you know, this is what we, uh, these are the made up values that we applied, but it could be a really powerful way to keep track of how many analyses you're doing per year, uh, what type of analyses and who you're doing them for, which is uh, something that I think our lab would be interested in as well. I think we know roughly what these are, but if we had a database, we could say exactly what they are. So that's uh, an example where we just uh, created an example report. Um, as I mentioned, you can make these as complex as you like. It could be a multi-page report. Uh, it could be simpler. Um, and you can just rerun that script periodically and it'll update it for you. Um, I know we're at the hour point here. I just have one quick last example and then we'll, um, we'll answer some questions if you like. But we just have this quick example here that we thought people might be interested in. It's uh, There's a global detrital zircon database uh, that was published by Voice et al. Uh, in 2011. And as part of their publication, they have a spreadsheet that has about 200,000 uh, ages in it. Um, and, and some other information as well. So Joe has written a script that's in that script folders uh, in the DZ part um, that you can, if you download their uh, spreadsheet, uh, which there's a copy of here, uh, in this case, the file name is Zircon Project, Journal of Geology 2011. Um, and if you run this script here, it will actually import that as a database. Um, that takes a little bit. Um, so I'm actually just going to open the created database. You can create that for yourself, but there's a copy here of the database that that would create. And I'm just going to open that for you so you can see what it's done. Um, so if I click on that, so this is, just, as with all our other databases, it's just a .db file. When you click on that, you will get a, an error, and that's because we're not, uh, the database is trying to check the, the modification times of session files, but this is, these aren't session files. These, this is a, a spreadsheet that's been brought in. So it's gonna report an error, but you can just click okay in that. And what it'll do, it's a, it's a reasonably large database. As I said, there's about 200,000 results. And instead of sessions on the left-hand side here, we have the name of the publication that they're in. And then over here, we have all the results that were included in the, um, in the spreadsheet. Uh, there are some things that don't really line up, but, uh, but there's a lot of information in there as well. One thing that uh, you can do is you can then import one of your sessions into this database and compare the two. So let's do that with our draw experiment. So we'll add, click the import session button here and we'll click on the draw example. And uh, <laughs> uh, let's just, in my case, I've already opened these. So if hopefully for yours, uh, you have the copy before I imported this. Let's do replace existing. And while it inserts. I 
may have just shot myself in the foot by doing that because I quickly ran through it before the webinar and I, uh, so I don't have a pristine copy, but let's see what, how we go. So now what we can do is we can run a script, the script that's in that file as well, that's called uh, dz underscore compare. And what that will do is it'll compare the session that we imported against this database, this global database of uh, Detrital Zircon um, ages. And what that will do is hopefully all going well, is it creates a KDE diagram. Uh, and in blue, we have the global database and you can see these peaks um, of ages. And then over the top of that, it will plot a KDE for our session file that we imported, the draw file. So as you can see that came in, there was a peak at about uh, 500 million years. And it's just a quick way to compare those. This is just sort of a quick example to sort of show you the power of, and, and there's, like I said, 200,000 results making up that KDE in the background. Uh, and it's a very quick way to compare your results to this global database. You could expand on that uh, quite a bit if you wanted to as well. So, um, and just so you know, the, there's the citation there and uh, there's also the, the paper and the references therein um, in that DZ file that we, that we distributed as well. So this is really just a quick overview of the basics of the database uh, feature of iLight, the idea that it takes the data from your session files and uh, creates a database for you that you can then uh, start to summarize, filter, visualize, those types of things. Uh, we haven't talked about interacting with external data repositories at all. That requires uh, each one of those data repositories will probably, probably has it, have its own API. Uh, and so uh, that will just be a case of when those APIs are published, we can then start to interact with them. And as I said, that can be a two-way street as well. That doesn't just necessarily have to be you pushing your data to those repositories. You could also potentially bring those in uh, and match data up that way. Uh, we haven't had time to talk about uh, eLab notebooks, uh, but if you're using eLab notebooks and you want to get them working with your database, we'd be keen to hear from you. Um, we haven't, as I said, in our lab, we haven't quite started doing that yet, but uh, any suggestions are greatly appreciated. Um, and also we haven't talked about this long-term reproducibility, this idea that you can um, estimate your uncertainties uh, inter-session uncertainties based on your secondary reference materials. This is something that uh, we're working with the BGS on at the moment to perhaps publish in the future, but you now have access to create your own databases. You can see these values for yourself uh, and you can start to make some uh, uh, judgments about uh, what your inter-session variability might be. So with that, uh, I think so I'd say thank you for listening to me for the last hour and uh, and open it up for some questions. I had a question on that last one there, the long-term reproducibility and um, something I'm very interested in for our geochronology stuff. Um, what would be ideal is if you could calculate a excess variance value on your secondary standards and then um, propagate that uncertainty into unknown analyses uh, within the sessions, you know, individual data sets. Is that something that is a possibility? Absolutely. Um, in fact, that's something that we've, that we've started on. Uh, there's a script there called uh, long-term that is the basics of that. That's what Joe has started on so far. I don't think I've added anything to that at all yet. Um, and that's the idea of that is that that would calculate. Uh, so at the moment when we do propagated uh, uncertainties, we're using this pseudo secondary pool of results based on your primary reference material, but that's not necessarily the best estimate of what you'd get if you were to measure session to session to session. Uh, you can actually calculate that here from just taking your, your pool of results, calculating that there and then adding, uh, and then working out what your excess uncertainty is there. So it would just be 
a case of replacing that pseudo secondary pool of results um, in that calculation. Okay, so I can have a look at that script and see what it's doing. Um, Absolutely. And then as far as implementing that into, a, you know, a, an additional sort of uh, fully propagated uncertainty, is there a way to do that within the session part of? No, it doesn't go back into the session do... part yet. Um, sorry, Joe. Gotcha. I was just going to, yeah, so it doesn't go back into the session, uh, but it does that script uh, at the moment will append a column to the database with the propagated error for whichever channel you're working with. So when, when oh, you okay. run the script, I think it asks you what channel you want to propagate the error for okay. um, and which reference material, which secondary you want to use to estimate uh, the excess error. And yeah. then it works that out and then adds it in for all of the uh, analyses and it'll create a new channel. I think it's Mm, I, I can't remember what it's called. It's not super yeah, well I, tested. I think that's why we're, we haven't. Uh, that's why we haven't advertised it uh, as much here in this webinar. But uh, sure. the, ev everything you need is basically there. Uh, just need to get some feedback on it. Okay. Well, I'll start playing with it. Sounds good. Great. Thanks, guys. It's actually really cool once you start looking at multiple sessions at once. Uh, I, I can't. I couldn't share it with us uh, with everyone. Uh, because it's not all my data, but there was one where I could see that most of my results were basically the same. And then they started to fan out in one particular experiment. And it turns out that I just got um, the spline type wrong. Um, and it was really helpful to be able to see it com in comparison to all my other sessions to be able to work out, hey, this one looks a little bit different. Uh, I have a question on imaging, which won't surprise you since you know that that's pretty much all I'm doing. When we do images, there is that possibility to export the image as specific XY data points from the sample, which you can then um, look at and make graphs and other programs. And I'm wondering if there's a way to make that automated export thing what becomes part of the database so that your images are all of those little tiny data points make that the selections uh yeah you could do that by if if those uh those groups of pixels related to the selections then it would automatically mm -hmm. come into the database and mm -hmm. you can make your selections related to certain properties of your image by setting mm -hmm. criteria for them so if you wanted those selections to reflect wherever the image was above a certain amount then you can do that in the automatic selections i don't know how uh how streamlined that process would be, how easy it would be, mm -hmm. but it's certainly possible. Yeah, because well, you've already got just the whole, like I will, one thing I do is I just make a uh, region over the entire image and then export that and it's got thousands of individual data points that I'm then using, I take into IOGAS and group them and say, okay, these are the talc and this is the hematite, et cetera. Um, but I think just even having just that basic, here's all of the data with its XY data points and its composition at that point as what comes into the database could be useful. Mm, absolutely. We could uh, also look into uh, importing information from the image manager, right, Joe? Mm -hmm. That would do that yeah. as well. Yeah, yeah. yeah, I think that uh, there could be uh, some applications there for sure. Because um, I can't be the um, only I... person focusing on images. <laughs> um, there's, yeah. a, there's a question as well in the in the chat. Oh, yeah. So Georgie's asking, I usually use summary stats in results to get sample means and errors because our studies, we need to run multiple analyses of the same sample. Is there a way to incorporate the data summarized in that way into the database? Uh, so do you mean like the group averages? Um, so summary stats in results to get sample means and errors because our studies need to yeah, run multiple. Yeah, that's, that's what I meant. Yes. Okay, yeah, so uh, 
You can. It, so the, all the selections that those values are made up from uh, are in the database and it would just be a matter of grouping those in the database to, ca to calculate those results again. Um, it would depend on how you've set it up to how no, just, just, just in, the, in, the, in the results in the results in the results section you have uh, very neat tools like to 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 uh, for outliers for all that kind of stuff and are they incorporated in a way is it, is it possible to, to do the same with database uh i'd say at the moment okay. no uh they're not there automatically but that is an interesting idea and something that I'll need to think about a little bit more, I think. Um, yeah, I don't have a, a, an easy way of doing that yet in the database. Would you agree, Jay? Yeah, I see. Yeah, yeah so the, at the moment, I wouldn't say that there's a streamlined way to do it. You can do using SQL statements. You can, you can like summarize uh, data. So you can, you can get sort of, you know, using queries, you could get the average of things that match a certain, uh, certain set of criteria and things like that. So you could you could get the averages that way using SQL, but I think probably the the best way forward would be to make some sort of uh, built-in plot that would be similar to the what you see in the results view to just to make it easier because I, <laughs> you'd, you'd be writing some fairly complicated SQL statements, I think, to get those averages out. Another way to do it would be also to do it through Pandas. Um, yeah, if, if yeah. you're familiar with uh, Python, uh, you could create a, a table um, uh, or a data frame from your results and then get the stats from that. I don't know how many packages out there that have sort of pre-built in outlier rejection and that sort of thing, but uh, sort of summary stats are, are, are pretty routine. You could get that pretty quick. Yeah, I see. Thank you. Thank you very much. I guess the, the, the problem with both of those is that, that it doesn't visualize it for you. So it, it would be no. nice to have something built in with some controls, I think, to visualize that. Yes. Yeah. Although I guess that's that's what the main part of Eyelight does, does well. <laughs> and the database side um, might be used for, I guess, more broader scale things. But uh, no, definitely that's something we can think about a bit more. We'll have to think about it a bit more. Great, thank you. Okay, so I guess at this stage, the database feature is still in its very early days. So we're very open to feedback on what you'd like to be able to do uh, and what you'd like to be able to see. So please let us know if there's any limitations that you come across or any ideas that you have that you'd like to see incorporated. Uh, and with that, we're still working on uh, on features, like we mentioned with the long-term reproducibility thing, that's something that we're still working on. There's still other things that we'll be adding in our lab, the solution analyses we're bringing into iLight so that you can run, uh, or you, we're, we're running all our solution analyses through iLight um, for the isotope systems at least, not for trace elements just yet. Uh, and they will then form part of a larger um, database as well. So yeah, it's still early days. Uh, we look forward to hearing from you. And if you have any questions or any feedback that you want to provide to us, feel free to hit us up on the forum or the support email. Uh, and with that, I'd like to say thanks to everyone for participating um, and uh, hope to see you all again sometime soon in the future. So thanks everyone. And uh, we'll end it there. <laughs>